Today, beyond the Royal Commission. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today, I'm joined again by John Dalson. Hello, John. Hi, not Martin. Great to see you, and uh, thanks very much for spending some time with us. Um, Pleasure. Now, we had a chat at the end of last year, and of course yes. your experience is uh, extensive both within the financial services sector as a director at ANZ and also as a commercial uh, manager as well. So yes. I think you've got some very interesting perspectives with regard to the Royal Commission and the outcomes. So we're going to spend a bit of time talking about some of those things. Yes. And I guess a really good place to start would be with, well, what do you think of the Royal Commission then? Um, I think on the whole, um, he's done he's done a very good job, but I do have uh, I, I do have a few misgivings. Um, first of all, um, I think the way he ran the commission was quite unique, and I think uh, a lot of a lot of future commissions will learn from the way he handled it. He, he did it on time, probably in budget, and it was very effective. Maybe it was handled a, a bit politically, but um, I think he's got the result and. Uh, uh, my misgivings shouldn't detract from the uh, overall benefit that will flow from his report. Mm, it's worth saying, John, I think, isn't it, that the exposure of, you know, directly the issues um, through those um, case studies was actually a remarkably powerful way of actually getting to the heart of the issues. It was, and he, and he had to be quite ruthless about that, uh, and he broke some of the canons of uh, uh, cross-examination in, in doing that, um, well, uh, I suppose the end, end justified the means. He was pretty tough on counsel. Uh, he selected the witnesses. He selected the material. Um, and he made it very difficult for um, counsel to uh, uh, to cross-examine. There were conditions about that that made it uh, unacceptable for most of them to do it. And the other thing, of course, is the banks didn't want to focus on it any longer. And maybe they may have been able to correct a few things, uh, but it probably wasn't in their interest to dwell on it because their whole strategy about this has been... Let's get it on. Let's get it over with so we can get on with things as usual. In a way, he's putting his finger on the question of culture and the issues around culture. That's right. And saying, look, a lot of this is greed. A lot of it's to do with the incentive structures inside the organisation. That's right. And also then saying, and the regulators have really not done their job either in terms That's of right. actually keeping, um, you know, the, the cop on the beep as, beast, as it were. Yes. And then he basically concluded that, well, a lot of the issues are clear and you know there are things that have effectively already been done through responsible lending and there are other things that can be done right. so so there's quite a lot of meat in his final recommendations but i think you, you also suggested that perhaps one or two areas where you do have some reservations so perhaps we could look at those briefly um yes yes i do um uh, i have uh, a deep reservation about the broker channel um as being articulated by many others um in in the press and i doubt if that Get up. I don't think any government can afford uh, to go down that path and for the broker channel to suffer the, uh, the consequences. Um, as I see it, uh, for the broker channel, which is a very important channel for the distribution of banking product, and it's not just there's 49,000 people in that channel, but there's a huge amount of capital that's been invested in that channel. Um, and I don't think that you can come to the conclusions he has without consider considering the competitive effects. And I think that's one of the one of the weaknesses that he didn't consider consider the competitive effects. Um, and uh, um, the market has essentially endorsed that view uh, by transferring a lot of value from the brokers to the banks, and they're very significant numbers. Although part of the transfer to the banks will be uh, retrieval of, uh, of loss value, but then you can debate that till the cows come home. But that but but that doesn't uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, I think a lot of his recommendations uh, on the broker channel behaviour were very good ones. Mm. But I have a serious issue with this question of uh, uh, conflict or conflict of remuneration. I think there's a uh, there's an answer to that. And I think one way of approaching it is to say no broker can sell his own product. Um, and, by, and, and what I mean by that is that any broker or bank, any of their related activities... Um, they can't sell the product. So in other words, the product, so in other words uh, if there's a franchise arrangement, you can't sell the product of the platform that you're on. 
And similarly, a bank can't sell its own products. Now, that in one hit would get rid of uh, a lot of his concerns about broker communication. And that's the other thing. It tests a bank. Because if a bank is truly interested in the welfare uh, of its customer, what it should do is to look at the market and see what other products are available instead of recommending its own. And there are lots of products out there. And I would suggest the, the, the likelihood of recommending their own product would be very low. Mm. So it, it really clears the way. And same at the broker end. Yeah, interesting, John. So the point there is you, you agree... You agree that the best interests clause, which is what he's recommended, is That's appropriate, right. right? So effectively, the broker should be acting on behalf of the customer. That's right. right? And which, of course, is, I think, what most customers would have expected anyway from a That's broker. Right. right. That's right. So, so tick there. But then in terms of saying, well, by switching the remuneration round to effectively get the customer to pay, we're actually creating another problem, which is that all the power then swings back to the major That's organizations. Right. So your suggestion is, well, if you actually change the mandate of the mortgage broker to best interest, but also then say, and that means you can't actually sell the products that's that right. you're tied to, you've that's actually alleviated the issue an alternative way. That's right. Hmm. You, you do. Now, in terms of the what, what he was trying to do, which is a very legitimate objective, is he was trying to turn the mortgage broker into a professional. Now, clearly, um, at the moment, they're part professional and they're part sales driven. And that's been, uh, you know, a major part of the way the channel operates and the way they behave. And they've always had this constant um, uh, tension between those two factors. You just simply can't change that overnight. But I think there are some answers to that as well. Um, I don't have a problem uh, with going to an upfront fee, uh, provided that fee is capitalised. In other words, it forms part of a loan. And the other way, which has been suggested by one of the analysts, is that it's not only the broker that incurs some cost, but so does the bank. So if you've got a fee of $5,000, then um, what you can, some of that is, is, is got to be attributable to the bank in terms of processing the application, et cetera, mm. and some of it to the broker. So um, you could work out a system where these of thing, it was a 50-50 cost, but wherever that cost is, it would still go be capitalised in the loan. Um, and so that immediate pain would go because if the broker uh, gets the fee up front, then uh, the, 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 the customer w won't be able to pay it because if you're buying a house and you're putting 10% down or whatever, or you're 20% down, the broker fee is a very significant addition to that cost and they simply won't be able to incur it. Now, if you go down my track, you then get you then get some tension between the brokers who will who will put to their customers the best fee, fee around. In other words, we, the customers, can say, well, that broker charges 2000 that charges 1000 And same with the banks. In the process of the broker making a recommendation, bank X charges 2000 bank Y charges 1000 So that way, uh, in a sense, the market will work. Yes, very interesting, John. And what you're really saying is create a level playing field between the third party and That's first right. party channel. Recognise that there are costs which are being generated That's whichever right. ever route you go, first That's point. Right. The second is there shouldn't be an unequal relationship between the That's third right. party and the first party. Otherwise, That's you right. actually end up with, a, with, with bad results. And I suppose the other point there is that if we, if we follow your logic, then you remove all the inherent conflict of the sort of the trail commission and all of those, those other things and the, you know, you searching for the highest commission because effectively now you're saying the mortgage broker is fundamentally working on clearly on behalf of the That's of, right. of the customer, which is That's actually right. what people thought anyway, I think. Well, um, it, well that's what Hayne want to achieve because he yeah. wants to get professionalism to it. And I think you achieve that, you achieve that in one hit because you remove that whole uh, question of conflict. Mm. And, 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 and a bank should be thinking that way anyway. I mean, when you're a customer of a bank, you're entitled to make the assumption the bank's looking after your interest. And I wrote a paper some time ago about all this, and I, was, I, I identified this uh, conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and I said that a bank should not recommend its own product because it's a fundamental conflict. It's got a fiduciary, fiduciary relationship with the customer, and it's not exercising. So I've been troubled about this for, um, you know, way before these uh, proceedings started. 
Very interesting. And I suppose you could extend it also to the financial planning sector as well, right? Because, of course, what one of the things he did say was that he sees a convergence potentially of the mortgage broking and the financial planning function. It's, right. it's the same process. It's, it's often right. the same topic. So it's it makes right. sense perhaps to use it more broadly. Yeah. But you can't, you can't go down his track because brokers are already uh, under a lot of pressure with a lot of the regulations being passed on. And I've spoken to several of them. They're really concerned. Yeah. They're also concerned that AMP, for instance, might be suing them to, retrie to receive, retrieve some of the payments they've got to make uh, in mediation. Mm -hmm. now, and, and now what this does, it puts a lot of cost uh, on the broker, but also it attacks the broker's revenue. So many brokerage houses will be absolutely uneconomic. And even when there's some consolidation, and I think there should be consolidation, I think we've got too many brokers, but I think, but I don't think you, you consolidate by being absolutely unbelievably and unacceptably tough on both revenue and cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. What's well, interesting, the UK, of course, went down this route four or five years ago following their uh, mortgage yeah. market review, and they ended up with two types of brokers. So they ended up those, those brokers who are effectively whole of market and can give you best advice, and, and they are clearly um, marked as that, and yes. many of them charge a fee. Others actually get a fee from uh, inside, but it's all disclosed. The others, yes. though, are tied and can only sell the products of that individual organisation, but it, again, it's transparent as to what their That's role right. is. So people in the UK know that if they go there, they're going to get independent advice. If they go there, they're not. That's but the right. other interesting thing is that they fees went up significantly. The costs of running the um, advice doubled pretty much because of all the other compliance issues and a lot of people who could have should have used a broker now choose not to because it's too expensive so i think we can learn some lessons from the uk yeah we can and and what i'm suggesting we'll let the the market work and over time we can sort that out the other thing is the government through uh presumably asset could say well we think the split in costs between a bank and a broker is 60 40 or 50 50 and i just throw 50 50 in for ease of argument but, you know, someone could do a, a clinical assessment on that and, and just ascertain uh, how much time a broker does have to put into uh, an application and just how much time and uh, what systems are in play for a bank to process a loan. Mm. So I think that should be left as an open issue to be determined. Yeah, well, I think they are going to do a review of some sort. So, uh, to my mind, the right terms of reference for that review when it's done is really critical, right? And needs to be broader than just, you know, is it fee or is it not fee? And you know, you, oh, I you think know. that I think that should be done now. Yeah, right. I think it should be done now, and I, okay. I, I, I won't surprise me if both both the, the government and the opposition the next year, because of the pressures mounting up, and reasonable and uh, rational pressure, yep. uh, and and for many survival. That they'll have yeah. no choice yep. uh, but to back off while they find uh, another solution. But you know, overall, the problem was that uh, pain was um, uh, insensitive to uh, uh, a competitive effect. Um, and in that space, uh, my other my other complaint comes under the same heading mm -hmm. because uh, what he was prepared to do was to incur a major disruption uh, of the uh, the broker channel of hundreds of people that don't have the clout of the banks. Yet he wasn't prepared to do that in relation to the bank, the banks in terms of uh, whether they should whether they should split out their uh, activities. Um, and he dismissed that in a very cursory way. And I was very disappointed in that because there's a very serious debate to be, to be had on that subject. Uh, and I would have liked that to have been aired because there's a number of uh, very rational uh, uh, discussion going on about that uh, and it should be heard and I think there's been a bill put into Parliament the last couple of days to try and achieve that um, but th there's a wider issue here it's not just the um, it's not just the the conflict issue um, but there are other issues with the structure of, of banks um, um, and uh, my view is and that's and that of course some people call glass steel uh, but I have uh, even a wider view uh, than the need for separation than just glass steagall And I think there are many arguments that justify that happening. I accept it's a complex subject, but I'm disappointed that we haven't had that discussion. Mm. What I fear is that Payne didn't feel with, I mean, it was a huge legal influence, all of the bucket load of uh, QCs and solicitors. Um, and I just wonder whether the, uh, his whole team was a bit unbalanced. Uh, and if they had have had some very smart people in there, 
truly understood the dynamics of competition, then he may have been prepared to get into that area. But my impression is that he may have been a bit frightened to get into that area because not in his territory. And the other aspect of this that I think is very important is the background role in all this. Normally with, uh, with uh, commissions, you get your list of witnesses, you get your submissions, and when the report comes out, you're told who was involved and you're led to the assumption that is the material upon which the commission made their decision. But the fact is, um, that's not what happened. It's quite clear, and I think it's been acknowledged, that the commissioner was having lots of discussions with ASIC. Um, and, and I believe there are other discussions going on. And I believe the Treasury, I don't know, I'm just guessing, the Treasury uh, had a lot to say. Now, I think that should have all been in the public arena. And I think it raises a wider issue about how these, how these commissions are run. Uh, and more recently, most of them have come out of uh, Treasury. Treasury established the uh, Secretary um, and a lot of their own people, which means there's a, there's a, a feed line, shall we say, uh, of information going hither and to. Uh, and I'd just like to know in the public interest a, a lot more uh, that goes behind the scenes. I'm not saying it's easy. I can understand why it happens, but I'd just like to know more about it. And I say that because of um, what's happened in relation to brokers and what's happened about their unwillingness to look uh, at structural uh, separation. Well, let's just talk about process a bit, because it's clear that, you know, the terms of reference were deliberately, I think, crafted to avoid That's some right. big areas up front, right? That's right. Uh, and we also know that uh, the RBA and Treasury and uh, other regulators all put very strong um, submissions right. in, which basically said, don't rock the boat, don't, you know, don't boat. tighten credit too much, don't go into areas of um, significant That's structural right. change within the banking sector. And that was on the public record, and you can it assume that there was a record. lot more <laughs> behind yeah. the scenes, right? Yeah. But then the other mechanism, of course, is that we, we're hypothesising here, but we suspect that a lot of the donkey work, and all, you know, all the writing and everything else and all the you know, documenting would have actually been done by the I Treasury like Secretariat. Well, I'd like to know the answer to that. When you read some section, particularly in the legal area, when he's using the first person, I think this or I think that. Now, I think in some of that area, when you're dealing with pure legal issues, I can mm. see his hand there because, you know, he is a, a first-class lawyer. He's got a first-class mind. And yeah. I don't think he can help himself uh, in terms of writing that part of it. But look, the, uh, uh, the, uh, there's, there's, some, there's some deep... There's some deep issues here, uh, and uh, I, um, you know, while it's very topical and while it's on everyone's minds, um, I hope it, uh, I hope it all, all comes out. Mm. Um, well, let's just let's just touch see, on structural separation just, just a bit. Okay, yeah. but that's what I want to talk about too. Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay. So 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 let's just tease that out a little bit more, right? So structural separation. There's lots of dimensions to this, right? And that's why it's complicated. But that's we've right. we've certainly got the, the the question of advice versus sales versus the manufacturing yes, of right. products. That's and right. today you've got that domination of the that value chain from from the big banks. So effectively, yes. you are advised. <laughs> independently quote unquote to buy a product from that same organization which you manufacture who, who builds the product so yeah. so that's the first line of argument and we think that's that should right. be bro broken out because you can't get in objective independent advice as you said earlier on no, if you you're can't. actually right. running the whole thing the second is of course you've then got these lines of business so you've got you know retail banking and you've got insurance and you've got yep. wealth management and, and effectively the cross sort of correlation between all of those is also a potential another area Absolutely. of control so so there's a matrix here that needs to be parsed apart because oh, frankly right. we've got it at the point where it's really complicated it's really complicated um, that's right it's also highly controlled by a small number of players that's right now i've got a view about that um mm -hmm. what uh Hain, he, he, he um thought that the, to do anything about that issue would cause more disruption than he's currently doing to the uh, to doing to the uh, uh, the broker chain. Now I don't happen to I don't happen to agree about that. I think structural separation of the banks is nowhere near as difficult as people are putting forward. I will acknowledge that there are stamp duty and gift duty issues, but that's easily solved because what the if, if this is a government directive, then the government uh, ought to say, well, you've got to do this. But we are going to give you an exemption from stamps. We'll have to subsidise the state. We will give you an exemption from stamp duty and capital gains tax to do this. 
And one of the, one of the reasons why uh, some people say it's too difficult is because of that. Mm. And I think that where a government is making a direction to reorganise a sector, and there are inhibitors there, which stamp duty and gift duty are, I think it's appropriate that they have an exemption to do that. Now, I know one bank looked at uh, a structural separation very seriously uh, on the basis of a holding company, and it wasn't ANZ, by the way, where I, I won't could I be wrong for me to talk about that, where they had a holding company, and when they had they had separate companies, separate entities for the various parts of, parts of the bank, and some of them might have had separate shareholdings. Now, they believed that was a very efficient mechanism, very efficient structure. The only reason they didn't do it was because of gift duty and stamp duty. So one bank's been down that path and said this makes sense to do it. So uh, I, d I, don't, I don't see the difficulty that, uh, uh, that, uh, that others might see. And there's a whole host of reasons why this might be more efficient. You see, our banks have become way too complex. The banks uh, have got their fingers into a whole number of disparate activities. And that's one of the reasons they're in trouble now, because they're so complex and so diverse, they can't manage them. And also what you do is when you break them up like that, you'll have separate regulation, separate regulation. So a bank arguing, I've got this massive regulation, which is a legitimate argument. If you separate, you'll then have the streamlined regulation that applies to that kind of business. You will have a closer connection between CEO and client. So uh, there are lots of, in my view, the business reasons for doing this are more powerful than the conflict issues, which you might find surprising to say. Mm. And presumably you can also get more efficient, right? Because if you're focusing on, you know, a, a narrow chunk of business, yep. and right. you, you've got more line of sight across that, that's the it. chances are you can actually optimise that part of the business, that's, you know, you, you, to that, make it that, more efficient. That's absolutely, you're, you're, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. You're saying it in, in, in better language. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, it makes everything more efficient. Board, CEO, uh, the customer's got a, another expectation. Now, there's another sound reason for all this. What's happened over the years is that there's been a significant change in the mix between business, business lending and residential mortgages, mortgages. Now, those figures are very profound. And what, what's, there's several problems with that. First of all, we're finished up in a situation where residential mortgages are way too big a share of uh, GDP, and business banking has shrunk. And uh, I, 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 I see this as a, as a, as a massive opportunity because if you segregate them, then the commercial bank, it's got to survive as a commercial bank, and that bank will do a lot more activity than they're currently doing. And, you know, what's happening at the moment is that the banks are being difficult about residential mortgages, but even more difficult about business transactions, and they're locking, knocking back a lot, of, a lot of stuff that they shouldn't be doing. Mm. So, you know, I, I think that this separation will fuel growth. Because the commercial bank has got to survive because it is a commercial bank. And I see transactions at the moment that the banks are saying no to that are plainly dumb, unintelligent and unfair. I hear about it because as a sort of ex-lawyer sort of banker, a lot of people uh, open up and talk to me. Mm. Oh, you know, see me. Oh, I must tell you this, John. And so I've had a number of people come, oh, look, I had this rejected by the bank, both in terms of residential and, and, and those are appalling transactions. I cannot understand why I think wouldn't do that. Mm. Well, certainly my SME surveys show that there are a lot of businesses who are really struggling to get the finance that they need to be able to grow. They yeah. can't make the investments that they want to make. Uh, yeah. and, and, you know, the bank is sitting there at the moment with, do I lend to that commercial business or do I ch chase that mortgage? Yeah. Less capital on the mortgage, easier to yeah. underwrite, so they're yeah. going to go down that route. So if you slice yeah. and dice that and give them more focus, I, I agree yeah. with you. The other point, of course, John, is you solve the not the, the too big to, to fail problem too, wouldn't you, by you, you effectively do. creating those well, small well, businesses? You, you solve that in a very powerful way because hmm. what you say is that the government guarantee on deposits can only apply to the retail bank. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't abandon that. I would just make that a problem of the retail bank, which means the retail bank would be able to borrow at a lower rate and, and lend at a better rate. Yep. The commercial bank, which has got a completely different risk file as opposed to the other one, will um, probably, it, it will lend, it, it's borrowing a bit more expensive and lending will be a bit more expensive. But at the moment, I don't think rate is relevant to the business. It's not happening. Now, uh, I'm, I'm, 
My family's in the trade business, and we're at the cutting edge of what happens in trade. We've probably got the biggest trade business in Australia. We've got about a thousand employees. So information streams for me to all of that. I've just been talking to one of my executives a minute ago about client X. So said, oh, gosh, he said, it's terrible. He said he's put up two proposals to the bank. Um, he's got pre-deposits, and the bank won't lend. Um, and his bank's been lending him to for a long time. It's a very solid business. So that's happening by the day and by the hour. And uh, I'm, I'm worried about it. And mm. what I foresee is um, is that so far the trade sector's been quite buoyant. We've always been too busy. But there's going to be a big wind down as it happens. Because a builder, you know, if a couple of transactions the bank say no to, that's a big part of his business. And, and, and that's an acute fear I have. By the way, the Reserve Bank talks with now and again because we're at the very beginning of the building process. We build a roof truss and wall frame. So we know when something happens because the builder orders a roof truss. So we're, you know, right. I don't think anyone except the fellow that lays the concrete is closer to what's uh, actually happening. And I'm concerned. Right. So just on that, are you seeing um, momentum easing? It will. Yeah. Because the yep. builders are going to be denied uh, finance for transactions that, are, that, that, that other was do. Now, I, I, what, what, I've got overall concern about this. I think the banks were being political. Mm-hmm. I think they went about some of the transactions they wouldn't do are so dumb. I can't believe they're true. And I think what the, what the banks were doing is they were withholding credit to give a message to Hain. And I think that's been very successful. And that's why I want to know what happened in the background. Because I think in the background, Hain was threatened. Look, Mr. Hain, you are going to cause a recession in Australia if you do this. And that deeply troubles me. And I think that's that's uh, an issue uh, of public concern, and I think we should we should be able to get to the bottom of it. Mm. Well, I think it should be transparent, right? The whole the whole process and the deliberation. Yeah, yeah. You know, which had the appearance of transparency. If there was a lot below right. the waterline, then effectively the whole philosophy behind the royal commission is suddenly blown up. Well, that's right. Uh, yeah. I, I was worried about the uh, the way witnesses were handled before the commission. No. And it's a long time since I've been a lawyer. So uh, I rang uh, one of the QCs that I dealt with in the past to check about my intuition about this. Uh, and what I've, what I've found is that the, uh, the commission made it, made it quite difficult for the lawyers. Um, and the impression gained was that they just wanted to get into the arena, the poor conduct, so they had a, a platform uh, to make all the, the platform to make all the recommendations, and the stronger the adverse conduct, the more chance they had of getting the reforms through. But in fact, what's happened is a lot of those situations that have already been dealt with, and the banks have moved on and and, uh, and improved things. Now, he did he, in his report he did lay out where the banks had made changes. But the problem is, it's what the public have seen. And what the public have seen is this high-profile uh, cross-examination in the courts where, you know, where um, yes or no, sir? And, of course, if, if you cross-examine yes or no, I think in a dozen sentences, I think I could convince you that black is white. Um, and so, so that was troublesome. But at the other hand, but then the, 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 I, the end justifies the means. So what I'm trying to say is, I don't think lawyers are beyond the ends justify the means. Mm. I understand, <laughs> and it's you know it's worth saying, isn't it, that the 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 case studies that they were, were tabled were ones that the banks and the other financial institutions delivered, right? So they exactly. actually knew about these issues inside their organisations yep. already, right? And, and, so, and, and it dealt with them. So, yeah. I mean, so in a way, there was nothing new. In a way, so, so we were looking at you know the last five to ten years of bad behaviour. That's right. But yeah. you see, it was important for the commission to get that into the public arena because what happens about this commission is going to be dependent upon public opinion. Yep. Now I predicted a long time ago that there would have to be a royal commission. If any government didn't do it, it would it would lose an election. Hmm. I have I'm happy, happy to be optimistic because I don't think the public this time are going to let it go. Hmm. Because the public's uh, intuitive view, and, and you know, Australians, the average Australians are pretty smart people, and I think we can sometimes not respect enough their intelligence. What's happened is 
that the Commission has vindicated the view that people have had um, at the coalface. Yep. And so I don't think they're going to. I don't think they're going to let it go. No, well, they certainly I shouldn't. I mean, my view is, you I know, th will. this is a really important time now because whilst the Royal Commission has come to an end, it That's doesn't right. it doesn't stop the pressure no. for change. And in fact, no. my, you know, the DFA channel and other people are actually trying to drive harder because we, we now absolutely know that there are things that need to be addressed yes, for the benefit right. of Australia That's Inc. That's right. You yep. see, um, you see, the banks call for it, theoretically. They want to get over and, over and done with quickly yep. so they can get on. Now, that has not that has backfired. Now, it's going to happen anyway. So their strategy of getting it over and done with and not having a forum there where people could, it's gone and things would settle down. I think this time might be different. Mm. I think well, the misbehaviour is so uh, profound and so embedded in people's minds, they're not going to let it go. Yep. So, you know, things like the broker channel, things like uh, the uh, breaking up of the banks, I think that'll keep running. Mm. And I think people like yourself have got a big role to play in making certain those conversations continue. Now, I'm not suggesting I've got the answer. I just want the conversation. Yep. Well, debate um, is important, right? And getting the issues right. out there and thinking that's about right. the options and alternatives. That's right. Ra rather than just sort of trying to shut everything down and say back to that's normal, right. right? That's right. We can't afford for that to happen. We can't afford that. This is very important that we now, uh, we, we, now we now deal with it. And mm. I'm optimistic uh, that will happen. And uh, as I say, I, I don't believe I've got the answers, but I'd like to, uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, contribute. Good. Well, you certainly are here, John, and I'm sure you will go and do it. Well, Let me just ask you one other question. Regulators, APRA and ASIC, yeah. right? Because that was the other big deal of yeah. effectively... Well, let's, came... let's start, let's start yeah. with APRA. Uh, okay. uh, I've been deeply concerned about APRA for a long time because um, uh, in my chairmanship of ANZ, uh, credit risk for a while, um, I observed a lot that was then happening, and I realised that's a long time ago. And one of the things that... that that concerned me was the incestuous nature of uh, what was going on, because APRA is funded by uh, by the banks. Now, uh, I've been so concerned. I wrote an extensive paper on APRA, uh, which is published in the IPA review, which goes into uh, um, a, a lot of the issues. Uh, after I wrote it, um, uh, an ex-employee contacted me, and he gave me a bit more data. But uh, but the material I wrote was ninety percent mine, and his ten percent reinforce what I was trying to say. Now, my view about APRA is that it has so underperformed and misled the public as to what it's all about that Hayne realised that he couldn't tackle it in that commission, and I don't, I don't believe he could have. But nevertheless, I think the government have done made a very good decision uh, in having a major review by Samuel. Now, uh, in my professional days, uh, Graham and I were adversaries, were often on the, each side, and I have uh, deep respect for him. He's uh, very able, uh, very independent, very intelligent. And he's got a couple of other good people with him. So I'm optimistic that he will sort um, uh, APRA out. Now, ASIC, I feel a little sorry for because with, AP with, sorry, with ASIC, ASIC had a terrible problem with funding. You know, when you get into a fight with a bank, and I, I've, I, I noticed one a while ago where the bank retained five QCs, and the resources the bank put into fighting that case were enormous. Now, if you look at it from the point of view of ASIC, ASIC has it, it, got a massive cost involved. And I don't think the public realised how much has to go into those big cases. So ASIC, as it was, had nowhere near the funding to, uh, to undertake these fights. And uh, I can understand why they went down the enforcement uh, mm -hmm. route. And I think that was very pragmatic. Now, whether that's, going to, whether that's going to change or not, and I think the current view is that APRA should fight cases, sorry, ASIC, even if, not, even if they know they're going to lose, because the important thing about these big cases is they do uh, lay down what the, what the law is. And while they might be very costly, if the judges do a good job, they'll articulate the law in a way which will cover up, which will cover and deal with a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, issues. Now, I'm not too sure many people uh, would share my view about that, but that's but that, that's uh, that's my experience. Mm. Well, that's interesting. The HEM example is is one. Of course, that's live at the moment because that's between uh, ASIC and Westpac, right? And yeah. I've noticed that today, in fact, 
um, ASIC has just put out an updated edition of their regulatory guidelines for lending, and they've yeah. basically made some more specific comments relating specifically to yeah. the use of benchmarks and their expectations, basically saying a benchmark is not the same as actually looking at the income and expenditure of individual households. That's right. Um, it can be a useful guide, but that's all. That's right. So you can see the sort of the process happening that's even right. now, right? That's right. It um, is yeah. yeah. And I think that's yeah. that's a good exam example. And yeah. I, sometimes people perhaps are frustrated at what ASIC... I, I'm rather in your camp yeah. here. I think ASIC has really had the damp end of the stick because I think they've, had, they've been struggling on multiple fronts with relatively oh, limited without funding. Without a shadow of doubt. Without a shadow of doubt. And I Whereas, think that the government have now staffed it up in a way where we, where we might... Uh, we might, and I think the people that they've staffed it up with, uh, we don't have to tell them anything. They're well aware of this, and they'll yeah. be right onto it. Whereas APRA, I think, probably um, was a very na narrow and opic in its view of what it should be doing, and it's probably still that's is right. because it's still saying it's about the bail implementation. That's and right. As though that's yeah. sort of everything, and it's not really. It's only a very small proportion of that's the right. total and question of financial stability. Absolutely, and that troubles me because it troubles me with reappointing Bowers. Now, he's done a very good job. Uh, in being a slave to the international requirements, as you've articulated. Yeah. But um, any suggestion, and he's done a very good job, by the way, in capitalising the banks. Yes. Um, but I think that's where it ends. And, and, uh, and, and by the way, New Zealand is bank, Reserve Bank in New Zealand is saying that's not enough. We need even more capital. So you know, we're still at the relatively yes. underexposed end of even on the new on yes. the new basis. Yes. And one one of the problems that, that that I've got in this territory is that uh, examining bank ca bank bank capital uh, is very complex and very difficult, uh, and I I have struggled with uh, struggled with it, and I don't think there's enough uh, information in the marketplace to explain the various components of capital like equity and hybrid etc. Yep. Now whether whether many people are going to take it up or take an interest in it, I don't know. But I think there's a there's a communication role there in uh, helping the public uh, uh, understand what it, what it actually means and comparing with uh, uh, other other models. One of the questions which I've got is there, there's a cultural imperative now being put back into the banks to change the banks, and one yeah. of the critical questions is what's the role what's the role of the board in terms of trying to drive the organisation forward. You know, NAB, of course, just um, got rid of their CEO and their, their, um, their chairman. So, so it seems to me that the question of the board and the function and nature of the board is really quite critical now. Uh, a bank board would, would be one of the most complex boards that you could ever sit on. Um, and uh, I've been involved with some very intelligent people and much more than me. And I noticed the time they took to learn banking. And it didn't happen overnight. Mm. I don't believe a bank of a, a bank director can be effective in less than twelve months, uh, and uh, they, are, they are extraordinarily complex. So banks, so board members of banks start up, start up with one big disadvantage. That's the that's the learning curve, and that's another reason why we should we should we should disaggregate the banks to make them more simple. And the fact that board members can't cope with it doesn't mm. that say management can't cope with it? <laughs> And I don't think they can. I, and I think that management is spread uh, over way too many, uh, way too many activities. Mm. So to that extent, uh, I'm on the side of board members. But but the other side of it is that where I do think they have some accountability is one of the things that stunned me, or has stunned me, I should say, is the amount of legal costs that's been incurred in the individual banks getting the information about misconduct. It's not millions. It's tens and tens of millions. Now, what I can't understand is why an organisation, a bank or anyone else, doesn't have an information system that tells you what's going wrong. Any other organisation would have it. Now, um, and, and now and I gather some banks are now putting it in place. So it was extraordinary to me that the banks had to engage so many lawyers um, so that they could self-confess the hate. They should have had that information. Yep. But what it shows is the distance between the executives, boards, and the customers. And this question of, uh, of board performance and cultural reform is very difficult. Let me make a couple of comments about it. First of all, I don't think you can deal with uh, culture generically or reform generically. The fact is, in a bank, there are lots of very disparate activities. And the cultural issues are different 
in each segment. And you really have to tackle it on a, on a, on a segmented basis. There may be some parts of the bank where there's, where obviously there's no cultural, where in others there are not. Now, I don't happen to think that it will take as long as some people think to change the culture of the bank. Because at ANZ, and I don't mind uh, talking about this, that I work with John McFarlane uh, in terms of reforming the retail bank. And simply, the way he, way he did that, and with a little bit of help I gave him from where I'd learned from uh, uh, Woolworths and Walmart, was that he fundamentally listened to the people at the coalface. So he set up a cell. I suggest we uh, um, do an experiment, John. Let's get a group of 15 branches. Let's get a good executive. And let's meet with these uh, personnel in all these 15 branches and ask them what are the problems. Well, first of all, they were stunned that someone was prepared to listen to them. But the second thing was that not only did these pro problems come through, but more importantly, suggestions came through. And that was a fantastic thing about it. And suggestions came from people that may not have been in that area. Look, we're not doing this properly because I have a fund of great faith in the average Australian. And the people of the coal face are exactly that. They know what's going wrong. They can tell you. So therefore, if you've got a structure that starts from the bottom and that information feeds up, it will drive a lot of change itself. And, 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 and John McFarlane managed to turn around the uh, retail bank, I'm not too sure, 12 months, I can't remember the time, and no capital, no, cap, no capital expenditure, just the way he approached it. Mm -hmm. And so what distresses me about banks at the moment, there's this incredible distance from what's happening at the coalface, what the people are doing. Now, if the senior executives had have listened in Commonwealth Bank to some of the things that were happening, it wouldn't happen now. Now, it's happening today. I went into a particular bank branch and the reception I got was shocking. Now, if they had a structure that John McFarnell set up, what would have happened is that those frustrations would have gone up there. And to me, this is a positive because when you look at something that's wrong, it's not just looking at it from the point of view of solving the problem for the customer, but there is something to be learnt in every transaction about how you do things. Now, the reality is there's so much information and power there and so many ways that you can change the interaction. But remember, but, but please observe, I haven't mentioned the word culture. Yep. And in a way, that's an important point, right? Because my, I have not wished the word culture. Yeah, because because top down, what you do is you say, I want to change the culture, and you sort of try and reign from on high, and you hope that it magically works through to the bottom, right? What you're yes. talking about is, you know, the quality circle approach where you get local engagement and you get people who know the business really well and empowered to start making change that's, bottom that's up. That's exactly right. Now, I think I said at the moment, I, I, I don't totally understand what the... Uh, uh, what the CEO is doing there, but he's got some kind of seller approach. He, he may be he may be repeating uh, what John McFarlane did. Yep. Now the relevance of this is that every part of the bank a bank is quite different. Now um, in, in the other areas you would approach it approach it quite differently. Now what does that mean? It means is that there are no generic solutions here. It's an un, it's an unpackaged solution, uh, and there should be more discussion and debate about it. But then I ask myself, now, what would I do now? Well, what I think I would have done um, two years ago, because it's so profound, I think I would have appointed a general manager, um, general manager, culture and reform, with a dual reporting role to the chief executive and to the chairman, and with him having an ex parte, uh, uh, sorry, a non-official membership of the executive committee. And it would have been his role to unleash this monster, and to uh, and to unpackage the bank, and to look at each division of the bank, and work out the best way to get that culture reform going there, as opposed to there. Now, the reason for doing that would be I don't believe that a CEO would have enough time to do it. I don't believe the line people would have enough time to do it. Uh, and I think and 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 the person that you get would be a very special kind of a. Uh, kind of a person that can that, that could facilitate that, but that's that's what what I would have done. 
But going back to where we started, uh, the boards are at fault because they didn't have this information. They should have had it because I would say to you that most boards, having had that information, they would have done something about it. I can't believe any of the bank boards would have sat there receiving that information and not taken some initiative. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Interestingly, John, the, the whole idea of root cause analysis, right, which is if when something goes wrong, you fix the problem, but you also ask why it happened. Yes, right? that's right. And, and then what you do is you actually uh, think about how you can change things so that it doesn't keep happening. My experience of working with a number of banks over quite a long period of time is most of them just slap on the elastoplast to try that's and right. sort of solve the immediate problem. They oh, yeah, never well. do the root cause analysis. That's right. Yep. That's and right. therefore, one, that's right. it keeps happening, and two, um, it's pretty much invisible to the rest of the organisation because it's that's kept right. down, in, down in, the, in the bowels of the organisation. So yeah, I agree right. with you. And Transformation, other, like you're talking about, is absolutely achievable, and it doesn't take 10 years. It does not take 10 years. No. You, see, you see with, with John McFarlane, Having seen this first sale work so well, it was an administrative step, and he can step aside from it, to set up another cell, yep. then another cell. Yep. And then with the cells, then it was important to reform the cell to whom they were reporting to. But easy. It became it became an administrative step. Yep. Um, not, you know, he didn't have to personally be engaged because basically he unleashed people. Now, yep. in our business, um, we have to deal with builders, uh, big, small, national, state. Um, and as you would expect in the building process, you often get problems by the very nature of it. Now, what we do is when, when, when a problem comes up, uh, our, we don't obviously want to solve it. We tend to believe the builder's right, which is not often the case. But what we try and do um, is we try and know what, what do we have to change to avoid this happening again? And we sometimes ask the builder, Joe, um, how can we how can we improve this for next time? And through that, you build a good relationship with the builder and you've got an open line with him. Say, look, if something's not going right, please tell us because we want to we want to understand why and fix it. Mm. So it's that kind of uh, and, and that kind of philosophy does exist in other other sectors. And this is nothing new now. By the way, this is pretty basic stuff. Yep. No one's going to make many money by writing a book about it. it, no, it really, it's so critical. It, it really is a question of, uh, of, uh, of, of attitude. Yeah, it is. And An a bit of humility, by the way. Yeah. But a little bit of humility yeah. and, and, and recognition that the average Australian is a pretty smart guy. And I've always had the thought that what you should be doing is actually having a customer board, right? So alongside the shareholder board and everything else, you, if you actually had customers directly involved in those conversations, you, you'd be in a very different position. So that's one of the things that I personally think should be part of the solution too. Well, you know, that's been, that's been uh, suggested before. I suppose uh, what I'm, I'm, I'm sort of almost suggesting that in that the person who would be appointed general manager would be very, very... Uh, just by the nature of it, it would be very, very uh, consumer, consumer focused, and he'd, yeah. he he would take the kind of attitude that uh, that, that John McFarland. By the way, uh, John McFarland would make a, an excellent chairman of NAB. <laughs> I see in the papers that was gossiped. One aspect of that I found very interesting. I've forgotten what the company is. What they've, I uh, wish I could remember. What they've said is, look, uh, shareholder, uh, we're not here for three months. Um, we're here for the long haul. So please don't invest in us unless you accept the fact we're here for the long haul. In other words, Mr. Shareholder who wants a short term, please go and, and invest somewhere else. Mm. Um, and that's not a bad line. Yep. Yeah, lo that's long, not a bad line. long term, building a business for the long term, right. building a franchise, building a franchise around consumers for the long term. That's right. Yep. Because Australia must have one of the, it'd be interesting to compare with other countries, but I suspect Australia must have, it'd be good to see analysis on it, Australia must have one of the uh, most heightened uh, short-term perspective on companies of any countries around the world, yep. I suspect, without, without knowing the facts. No, I think you're right. And, of course, the focus now is because revenue is not growing on cost-cutting, 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 right? right. Which, which actually might 
put them completely in the wrong direction because essentially, um, you know, sometimes you have to um, think differently about the business rather than just uh, trying to downsize and right size the current that, business. That's absolutely right because this now is the time for long, long term perspective and it's time that they should make that shift. There's a one other little plea, if I might make it. Sure. Um, I have a, uh, a concern about how uh, the employees of banks at the coalface are being treated. Mm hmm. Uh, uh, and I went on uh, on television to uh, air my concerns. Uh, they're being hammered. They're being hammered. They, they're in fear of losing their jobs because the banks are cutting their costs. And I think they're the missing ingredient in this whole subject. There's been no discussion about the role of people in the banks. They are being bashed. And I think we should be uh, we should be a bit more uh, a bit more uh, sensitive about that the tough time that the people are having at the coalface. And I think it goes back to my earlier discussion. Is they're far more important than people are to believe. They can make a major contribution to turning to turning the banks around, in my view. Yeah, no, that's a really good point, John. And in fact, there's a bit of theory that says what you need to do. If you think of the bank like that with the CEO at the top and all the that's people right. below, you need to turn it around, in fact, because it's the people at the coalface that who are the most critical, right? Well, the the and, first time I saw that equation was by Paul Simons at Woolworths, and Paul yep. uh, was absolutely passionate about that, and he kept on hammering. Uh, I don't want to hear from you guys. I want to hear from the guys. And he uh, he, he meant it, yep. and he talked incessantly yep. to the people at the coalface, and sometimes he even, even exhausted me because he, he was getting repetitive information, but he literally took it on board. And, and, and that's why he was a great chief executive. And to give you a very interesting insight, uh, we had problems at Woolworths, and I don't mind talking about this, because when we floated, he insisted on a relatively low salary. Because he, his philosophy was, how can I, how can I neg negotiate with the people on the coalface and hold their salaries down if I continually have salary increase? He wouldn't take a salary increase. So he had great cred credibility with the, with the coalface. Mm. So... In banking, it's the converse. We're seeing these banks earning huge sums and things are going wrong. And what I thought recently, and Gail Kelly almost said it, if a bank CEO said, look, I'm very concerned about this, I'm going to take half the salary or whatever, do you know what I think would happen? I think the share price would go up. Because, because that is showing a real change in culture. How can I be reconstructing the bank, pushing, making people redundant, holding down their wages, and I've got these inflated salaries? So I think, and, and you know, a CEO, um, the money shouldn't be that important to them. Mm. The role they're playing in leading an organisation, leading tens of thousands of people and influencing the economy, should be great to give them a great deal of personal satisfaction. But someone that wants to tie with that and inflate the salary because some guy over in America is getting it. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. So let's hope one of them does this. And I'd like to take a bet with you that if one of them does it, the share price will respond. And measure the gain in share price with the amount he's reduced his salary. Am I being too optimistic? Am I being too optimistic? <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be interesting to see. I tend to agree with you. I think remuneration has got completely out of hand and um, it gives all the wrong signals. Um, yeah, so I agree, I agree with you. Yeah. So, John, standing back a bit, it sounds to me as though actually you're quite positive, right? So, so what you're saying is the Royal Commission has exposed some very significant and important issues. Yes. There are things that can be done, yep. and if they are done, we're in the yeah. situation where we could yes. make our financial system in Australia work a whole yes. lot better. That's right. I, I am. No. I'm, I'm optimistic mm. about it. Mm. I think he's done a first-class job. Yep. But there are just two or three reservations, mm. and all I ask is that we have more conversation about them. I don't well, have the answers. Mm. Well, I just like to just like to I just like them to, to to be in the public arena so we can have an open and uh, open and frank uh, discussion about them. Well, you're certainly through the DFA channel. Um, we'll we'll be able to have you know this conversation, and I think we'll have to have some follow up conversations as this develops because I think that some of the insights that you've got from your you know your particular perspective are really really powerful, and I I think that um, um, if we can 
you know, get the brains of the nation, as it were, focusing That's on right. helping the banks to actually achieve the outcomes that we know That's are right. fe feasible, then it's a win-win. Thank Good. you very much. Thanks very much. So there you have it, a really powerful perspective from John, who really understands the way that financial services work. And I think he's got some really important points that could transform the way that financial services works in Australia. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance and Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you again next time.